Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we will begin. Father, we ask your pray, uh, your blessings upon our time together this morning, and we thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for these that come and are faithful to come and to share in the teaching and the learning of the word. And Lord, I just pray that as we go through this morning's session that you will give us the discernment and the application of the word to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to go ahead and read the first 14 verses in chapter 9, and then we will begin. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bed, bread, which this is called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded in the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been, dis has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of, bull, of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, heifer sprinkled, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, again, as we go back and we, and we look at what's going on here, the writer of the book of Hebrews has, um, is trying to educate Hebrew Christians about the new covenant, about the things that are taking place with the person in the, the, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, and how that relates to the old covenant. And he began this session um, in chapter, chapter 5 saying that they were immature and that he had much to say about, uh, about these matters, including the, the priesthood of Melchizedek, but he couldn't because of their immaturity. But then he goes on after he talks about uh, their need to go beyond the continual sacrificing for their sins or the continual being saved over and over and over again or trying to be saved and over and over again by trying to look at the ministry of Christ the same way they did the old, the old covenant. And then, so he began into this, this, sec, this section dealing with the covenant and the work of Christ, the ministry of Christ, as the eternal high priest. Now last week we, we talked about the new covenant. We talked about uh, the covenant that was promised in Jeremiah chapter 31 when God said that in, there's coming a day when I will... Uh, in, a, in effect, or I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And we're trying to make sure that we, uh, we understand the distinction between that covenant and the new covenant of his blood, which he affected while he, when he was, went to the cross and died for the sins of everyone. So I, want to, I just want to review a little bit about what we talked about last week in looking at the old covenant and the new covenant of his blood. Now, I want to distinguish between the new covenant of his blood and the new covenant in Jeremiah because the new covenant in Jeremiah is a future covenant that God is going to effect with the whole house of Israel. And there's a distinction between the new covenant of his blood that's in effect now and the new covenant with Israel or the future covenant with Israel that he's going to effect according to Jeremiah 31. And you need to understand the distinction there because... We're not under that covenant of Israel. That's a covenant that will be enacted 
upon the nation of Israel and the people of Israel in the future, but we are impacted and affected by the new covenant of his blood. And, and I want to talk about that because in, in Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is doing, uh, he's, he's meeting with the disciples and they're going through the Last Supper, and he talks about his sacrifice for their sins. And he says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, well, in verse, starting in verse 26, he says, And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to, his, to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to all of them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he mentions and talks about the fact of the new covenant of his blood. And we talked last week about the fact that the new covenant of his blood is the eternal covenant that God ordained before the foundation of the world when he ordained that Jesus Christ would become flesh, the Son of God, the well, the, the, land, the Word of God would become flesh and dwell amongst us and then take His place and die a, a death on the cross for the provision of sin. And this was foreordained before the foundation of the world as the covenant, the eternal covenant, that God would take away their sins. Now, if you remember back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus came and He killed an animal and he covered them with skins. And he promised that there was coming a day when a, the seed of woman would come and be a sacrifice, would take away the sins of the world. But until that time, he initiated a procedure of shedding the blood of animals as a covering for sin until the true Lamb of God would come to take away sins. And so when we get to the, the Old Covenant, there's... there's the Old Covenant is the Mosaic Covenant. Now, when we're talking about covenants, there are many other covenants that we talk about. The Abrahamic Covenant was a covenant. The covenant that God made with Noah that he would never again cause the earth to be flooded with rain. These are covenants of promise. So you have the Abrahamic Covenant and the Davidic Covenant, which where God promised David that he would have a throne and that his descendants would reign over the throne forever and ever, and it would never, there would never be an end to that eternal kingdom of David's throne. So these were covenants of promise, but they're two covenants that deal with God's provision for dealing with sin. The, and, and they're both called blood covenants. And the covenant of blood, because it takes the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So he's talking about a blood covenant. In fact, when you look in Hebrews there, turn, it over to chapter, uh, turn, turn the page over to chapter 15, I mean, verse 15 of chapter 9. And he says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal, of the, the eternal inheritance, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For the covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives." So he's talking here about a distinct kind of covenant that requires the death, requires a death for the covenant to be enacted. And in the first covenant, there was the death of bulls and goats. And it was for the provision of forgiving sin temporarily until Jesus came and dealt with sin permanently. But in the old covenant, which he's talking about the Mosaic covenant here, the Old Covenant, there was a provision for sin that required the death and the sacrifice of animals. In the New Covenant of His blood, it requires the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins for everyone. So when we're looking at the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant here, look at the, the Old Covenant as the Mosaic Covenant that God enacted with, with Moses for the nation of Israel versus in contrast to the new covenant which Jesus enacted when he died on the cross. And this is not the covenant that he promised to Israel and Jeremiah. This is the covenant of his blood. This is both, in both cases, we're talking about a blood covenant. 
to take away or to deal with sins that God is dealing with. Now, in the Old Covenant, you had only the sons of Aaron, the tribe of Levi, could be priests of the Old Covenant. It was only for the nation of Israel. And it required the sacrificing of animals, of bulls and goats, for the provision of sin. And we'll get into the details of that in a little bit. But the Old Covenant was a blood covenant. It required the shedding of blood of bulls and goats for the covering of sins temporarily. The New Covenant is not tied to the nation of Israel, the New Covenant of His blood. We're not talking about the New Covenant in Jeremiah. The New Covenant of His blood is where there is a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek that is a universal priesthood. So Christ is a universal priest that is not tied to the nation of Israel, but is tied to everyone. It says in verse 15 there, it says, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal, the eternal inheritance. So the eternal covenant is the covenant that God made before the foundation of the world that he would take away the sins of all those who he had chosen to save through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the difference between the new covenant of his, of, the, of his blood and the old covenant of blood is that the new covenant is not tied to Israel, it's not tied to the, the Levitical priesthood, and it's not tied to the blood, the blood of bulls and goats. It is an eternal priesthood with an eternal covenant, with an eternal person, Jesus Christ, dying as an eternal sacrifice, a permanent sacrifice to take away the sins of the whole world, not just the sins of Israel. So that's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, in Jeremiah 31, he speaks of a future covenant. And this is what is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, but it's, it's in its entirety in Jeremiah 31. He says in verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart, and I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now this is the covenant that is future that he talks about that he is going to make with the nation of Israel in the future. It's the same covenant that he mentions in Romans chapter 11, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, after the church is complete, when he says in verse 26 of Romans chapter 11, and thus all Israel will be saved, and just as, is, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will remove ungodliness from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So this covenant will be enacted at the time that Christ returns, after those days, which he's referring to as the days of judgment upon Israel in the tribulation time, after those days and after the days of the church age when God is bringing in the fullness of the Gentiles, after those days he will turn his attention to Israel and he will effect a new covenant with them that is based on the promises that God is making and it will be based on the blood covenant of Jesus Christ's death on the cross because he will take away their sins. So, in the future, Israel will become participants or partakers in a new covenant or a future covenant that will be on the basis of the shedding of Jesus' blood, not the shedding of bulls and goats, but that will be in the future. Right now, we are all recipients of the benefits of the blood covenant of Jesus Christ because we have forgiveness of sins. And this is the covenant that we are called to minister in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he calls us as ministers of a new covenant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, 
In verse 5, it says, not, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit of the letter, for the, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So we are ministers of a new covenant, but we are not ministers of a future covenant with Israel. We're ministers of the blood covenant of Jesus Christ, who the covenant that he, that he made to take away sins. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching that there is forgiveness of sins through the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood. And that's the covenant that we are ministers of, not a future covenant with the house of Israel. So there's the old covenant, in this, in this reference here, the old covenant is God's dealing with sin under the covenant he made with Moses through the sacrificing of animals, and the new covenant is the new covenant of his blood that he, that he manifested forgiveness of sins through, this, through the death of Jesus Christ. Now, one other thing that I wanted to mention before we get into the passage dealing today, and that is the issue of the blood. Now, in, in John chapter 6, Jesus is speaking to the people of Israel, and he's speaking about the bread of heaven, or the bread that comes down out of heaven. This is after he had, he had did the miracle of feeding the the 5,000 and the multitudes were following him because of the miracle of the food provision and all that. And, and it's an interesting passage. In, in chapter 6, verse 41, it says, The Jews therefore were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews therefore began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue, and he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? So when you hear that said, what does it mean when he says, You can eat my flesh and drink my blood? Is he talking literally? Would that even make sense? Of course not. So he's not talking about literally. And so even and so in... in um, when we, when we do the Lord's Supper, and we quote uh, the passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, which comes from the Lord's Supper that he gave to the disciples, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So when he's talking about drinking the, the wine, eating the bread, does this refer to a transformation of his body and blood? Are we really eating the blood of Christ, or drinking the blood of Christ? And what does the blood signify? When we're talking about there has to be the shedding of blood for salvation, for forgiveness of sin, what does that mean? Does it mean that the blood itself is what causes forgiveness of sin? No. What does the blood represent? The blood represents the life. So when Jesus dies on the cross, he gave his life 
as a payment for our sins. There's nothing mystical about the blood. The blood of Jesus, the blood that flowed through Jesus' veins, was normal blood. It was human blood. The blood that flowed through the veins of bulls and goats was normal blood. There was nothing in the blood itself that made it provisional to take away sins. If it was just the blood, you could have, take, take, you could have taken blood out of an animal and, sa- and cast it upon the altar. It's not the blood, it's the life. There has to be the shedding of a life. There has to be the giving of a life for the forgiveness of sins. It's not magical or mystical about the blood. It's about the giving of the life. Jesus gave his life. And when he's talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, he's talking about acknowledging that it's in the life and the death of Jesus Christ that we have life. It's not in the physical aspects of his body or his blood. It is in his life, his being. And so the covenant that he enacted when he gave his life was the, that he became a substitutional, substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Any questions on that before we go on? Okay, turn back to Hebrews chapter 9. Just remember that when we're talking about the Old Covenant here and the New Covenant here, even when the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about the Old Covenant, in the book of Hebrews, he's concentrating on the aspects of the Old Covenant that dealt with the forgiveness of sin, that dealt with the taking away of sins or the covering of sins. He's dealing with that aspect of the Old Covenant as he compares it to the New Covenant, which is dealing with Jesus' ministry of a permanent taking away of sins. It's not dealing with every aspect of the Old Covenant, including all the promises and all that. He's talking about the aspect dealing with sin. And there's always a death dealing with sin. And that's why we get into next week, or two weeks from now, when we talk about the New Testament or the New Covenant that requires a death, because in dealing with sin, there has to be a death. You can have another covenant, a promise, that doesn't have to deal with death, but if you're dealing with sin, there has to be the shedding of blood or the taking of a life for the forgiveness of sin. So when he's talking about here in verse 13 of chapter 8, he says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old, is ready to disappear. He's talking about the new covenant to take away sin versus the old covenant that was a covering for sin. And so in the first part of chapter 9, we're, having, we're going to see a contrast between what was there in the old covenant and what is there in the new covenant. Now, first of all, in verse 1 of chapter 9, he says, Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and earthly sanctuary. Just be careful when we talk about God doing away with the old covenant, that he is not in any way insinuating that there was something improper or not correct or right about the old covenant. The Old Covenant was instituted by God. It was right. It was a right time for a covenant that God, that God initiated with the people of Israel. There's nothing wrong with what God did in that covenant. It was correct. God made a covenant with Israel, but the purpose of that covenant was to make a picture or a shadow of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In other words, in verse, in verse 5 of chapter 8, it says, who serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things, just as, God, just as Moses warned. So the old covenant was a shadow or a picture of the new covenant. The old covenant was a shadow and picture of what would happen when Christ came in a permanent sense. And so he talks about that, and he says they had, they had regulations of divine worship and earthly sanctuary. It was true worship. And for, in fact, that word ordinances or regulations, in your translation it may call it ordinances of divine worship. In the New American Standard, it says regulations. That word means that it has, been, it has legal rights or has been approved and accepted by God. It means this form of worship in the Old Covenant was accepted by God and was right. 
It was legal. It, it was the right thing for the people to do to obey the hev- the, 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 all the provisions that were in the Old Covenant. It was the right thing to do for them to practice that, and it was true worship. When they came and they offered the, the blood of bulls and goats, it was true worship to God. It was what God ordained, and it was right. It was the right thing to do. So it's not like we're saying that the Old Covenant was faulted. It's just that we said last week, the Old Covenant could not take away sins, but it was what God provided to show them a picture of what could take away sins. So don't just throw it out and say, well, since it was the Old Covenant, it had no valid place. It had a valid place. It was the way that they came to God to worship Him in truth, and God accepted that as true worship. So the first covenant was a temporary covenant, but it was a valid covenant. Okay? Now, let's look at a few of the characteristics of the Old Covenant. First of all, it had an earthly sanctuary. In verse 2, it says, For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which there was the lampstand, the table, and the, and the sacred bread. That is called the holy place. And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies. Now, here he's speaking of the tent or the temporary place of worship that they had in the wilderness. It started out with a tabernacle. It was a tent. And that God gave them specific instructions on how to build this tent, this tent, this place of worship as they traveled through the wilderness. And it was portable. They would take it down, they would put it back up. It was a portable tabernacle. Now later it was transformed or transferred to the temple which had the same concept in the temple that the tabernacle had as a temporary place of worship became permanent place of worship in the temple. So basically what you had is you had a earthly sanctuary for the worship of a heavenly God. And this was the description and the outlines of the earthly tabernacle. First of all, you had an outer court in the in the place of worship when they met in the tabernacle you had an outer court and when they built the temple you had the the walls that went around the temple complex and you had the outer court and in the outer court you had uh, the bronze or the brazen altar and you had the bronze basin where the priest would wash and had the ceremonial cleansing and this was done in the outer court and the people could come in and have access to the outer court and then you had a holy place, which is where the, only the priest could go in. And the priest would go in to the holy place. In the holy place, it says, uh, in, in the holy place there was three things. You had a lampstand, which had lamps of oil. And we'll talk about what the priest did with the lampstands in a second. And then you had a table that had the loaves of bread, the showbread, that they had on the table there in the holy place. And then you had, and this is a little confusing to me, it's because you have an altar that where they offered incense. But here it says the altar of incense was in, was in the holy of holies. Turn to Ezekiel, I mean turn to Exodus chapter 30. We won't spend a lot of time on this because we're not studying the temple itself, but since it's in the text, uh, I don't want to just pass it over without trying to clarify a little bit. In chapter 30 of Exodus, and giving a description on the priestly functions around the tabernacle, it says in verse 1, Moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense, and you, you shall make it of acacia wood. Its length shall be a cubit, and its width a cubit, and it shall be a square, and its height shall be two cubits. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, its top, its sides, all around its horns, and you shall make it. You shall make a gold molding all around for it. And you shall make two gold rings for it under its molding, and you shall make them on its side, side walls on opposite sides, and they shall be holding holders for poles on, with which to carry it. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you, and you shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the Ark of the Testimony, or the Ark of the Covenant. 
in front of the mercy seat that is over the ark of the testimony or the ark of the covenant, which I will meet with you. And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it, and he shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. And when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. This shall be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Now, here he says that this altar for burning incense is at the front of the veil that goes into the Holy of Holies. Which makes sense because if he's offering, if he's burning incense every day, he only goes into the Holy Holies once a year. So he would only go into the Holy Holies once a year for the Day of Atonement. And so it seems like that the, the altar of incense, for burning incense, is on the outside of the Holy of Holies, right next to the entrance to the Holy of Holies. But I know that when he went into the Holy of Holies, he would take a censer of of fragrance of, of incense to take into the Holy of Holies with him when he went in once a year to offer that to God. And so I don't know if there was two altars, one inside and one outside uh, to burn incense on. I'm not clear on that. In, in the Hebrews passage, it makes it sound like that the altar of incense is in, is in the Holy of Holies. So either there's two or the offering of incense in the Holy of Holies was once a year. But anyway, the, the, what I was, the point he's making here is that there is a sanctuary that was provided by God, and, and this is the picture of the sanctuary. You had the outer court, you had the holy place in which the priests went in daily to minister. This is where they brought in the sacrifices, and they, they, they sacrificed daily for the sins of the people. They burned incense daily. They trimmed the wicks of the oil lamps, and they uh, filled the, oil, the lamps with oil. And every Sabbath day, they would change out the bread on the table of showbread. Okay, And then you had the Holy of Holies, which <clears throat> it says in verse 4, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But all of these things we cannot now speak in detail. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So in the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And above the Ark of Covenant was the mercy seat where you had the cherubim. And this is where the, the priest would go in once a year into the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the sins of people that were unknown. In other words, people went daily. If they knew that they had a sin, they would go daily to the priest and he would offer sacrifices for them daily. But there were times when they would be unknown sins or sins that they committed without knowing. So once a year... God had made provision for them to have a day of atonement which would take care of all the sins of the people of the nation for the whole year and the process that they went through, uh, that the priests went through in great detail. And we're not going into detail, just like they did. he said he wasn't going into detail. But the priest would take off his priestly garb that he wore, the, the elaborate robes that he wore in his normal priestly duties. On the day of atonement, he would take that robe off and he would put on a clean white linen cloth, a linen robe, and he would go into the Holy of Holies without his fancy garb that he wore daily, and he would have to make provision for his own sin before he would go in, and then he would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would make the, the atonement uh, offering once a year for the people, and then he would come out and put back his priestly garb on or priestly robes on, and then go back, and there would be a two goats, one would be the scapegoat in which he would place his hands on the goat and they would send the goat out. And the other goat would be killed and sacrificed as an offering. And sometime when we have a time to go through the study of all that went on there, we will do that. But this is just talking about the, what was happening with the old covenant. There was a continual sacrificing for sin. There was a continual worship in a certain way that God ordained in an earthly sanctuary in which the people had no access to the Holy of Holies and they had no access to the holy place. The things of God were only available to the priest that was representing the people. The people had no access to that themselves. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about that? The significance of that earthly tabernacle and earthly temple was God met them to worship the people there. 
and they are only he made provision for their sin he made provisions for their their needs but he made so through the through the priest and not to directly to the people now in verse 8 it says the holy spirit <clears throat> is signifying this that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing which is a symbol for the present time Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. So here he's saying that everything that was going on with the Old Covenant was of a temporary nature, symbolic nature. It represented something else. So it was of a temporary nature, and it was of a symbolic significance. Now he says that, that the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed. Now he's talking about a way into heaven. A way into having access to God himself is not possible while there is still this earthly tabernacle. Now, <clears throat> what is uh, amazing to me is what happened on the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, Jesus is on the cross. He has made provision for sin as he died on the cross. In verse 50 of Matthew 27, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rock split. Now God rent the veil. And I think he's talking about the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. God rent the veil. Now what did that signify? When God rent the veil, when Jesus died on the cross, what did that signify? It, 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 it signified that the old covenant was done. The earthly tabernacle was over. Access to God was now through the Son, through the new high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So now there would be access into a different sanctuary because the earthly sanctuary, the earthly tabernacle was completed. So I think in renting the veil, it signified that God was no longer there, that God was no longer meeting them in the holy place or the holy of holies in that temporary tabernacle, that the holy place, the outer tabernacle, was no longer still standing. Now what's probably... I don't know how this happened, but I would imagine after Christ died and ascended to heaven and they, the priests went into the temple and saw the veil rent half and two, I imagine they fixed it back. Don't you think that they patched it? It's kind of like when Moses came down off the mountain and he had the glow of God and he had to put a veil over his face because so, he was so bright. And then later on, the brightness was gone and he put a veil on his place so they wouldn't know the brightness was gone. And so I think that they probably put the temple, the veil back up, patched it up and put it back up so that people would know that it was, it was insignificant anymore, that, that, there was, that God wasn't there. But obviously when God tore the veil, it signified that he was no longer meeting them in the earthly tabernacle. They had to meet him through the sun to go to the heavenly tabernacle. So now we have... A different, a different sanctuary. And that's what he goes into next. And this is the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in dealing with the forgiveness of sins. So in verse 11, it says, When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. So the, the heavenly tabernacle is not made of things that were part of the creation. Now, what did they make the earthly tabernacle of? God was very specific. You had to have, the tabernacle had to be made exactly this way. 
They used acacia wood. They used gold. They used different things that came out of the created world that, that they lived in. So the earthly tabernacle was of the earth. It was earthy. And now he's talking about a heavenly tabernacle that is not made with materials from earth. It's made from materials not of this creation. Things in heaven. So he's talking about a different, a different sanctuary. Now, when God gave instructions, when God gave instructions for the earthly tabernacle, he said that the specific instructions were to make it a copy of the heavenly. So we should have some clue or some indication that the heavenly sanctuary is in some way, appearance-wise, constructed something like the earthly tabernacle would have been. Because it was a, the earthly tabernacle was a picture or a shadow of the, of the heavenly. So, but it wasn't, the heavenly sanctuary is where God is permanently, personally. Okay? So Christ appeared as high priest of the good things, not a high priest according to the order of Aaron or the order of the tribe of Levi, but according to Melchizedek, which was an eternal picture. Melchizedek was a picture of an eternal high priest that had neither beginning or ending, that was not limited to Israel, didn't have to have the name associated with the tribe of Levi. He was a priesthood that was universal. He says in verse 12, And not through the blood of, bull, of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For with the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works and to serve the living God. So here you have the the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, it is a heavenly sanctuary. Our high priest has entered into the heavenly sanctuary and has cleansed the sin forever by his shedding of his blood, by his giving of his life on the cross. He made provision for sins forever and he has entered into the Holy of Holies in the heavenly sanctuary and now he sits at the right hand of the Father as our high priest, and we have access to the throne room of God by going straight to the Father through Jesus Christ. And when we die, we are ushered into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies because the blood of Christ has cleansed us from all sin, and we have access to God now without going through an earthly priest without going through an earthly ministry, without going through an earthly tabernacle, we have access directly to the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly, the heavenly holy of holies, and the blood of Christ has obtained eternal redemption for all of us. So, he has contrasted the old and the new, and it is all dealing with the taking away of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the dealing with sin, making us pure and right before God. Whereas the old was a temporary covering of sins, it was the shedding of, of blood of bulls and goats, it was a temporary covering, it was a provision that God made for them on a temporary basis until, it says, in verse 10, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. The true reformation is when Jesus Christ took his place as the preordained, eternal Son of God and completed the eternal covenant to take permanent, eternal provision or make eternal, permanent provision for sins. And when that took place, it says over in Ephesians that he took captives captive and, and he who had descended from heaven ascended back to heaven and all the saints of God that were called of God before the foundation of the world that are chosen before the foundation of the world and called of God, all those now have 
eternal provision of sin dealt with by the eternal Savior who died once for all and has taken that payment back to heaven and has cleansed forever. And now, all of those who have are partakers of this new covenant with Christ, it says, our conscience from dead works to serve the living God, he has written on our hearts the truth of the word of God because we have the spirit of God indwelling us. Now, this will happen to the, the nation of Israel when Christ returns, but it has happened now to us as recipients of the new covenant of his blood, the forgiveness of sins forever and ever. And so to the writer, the writer to the book of Hebrews is telling these, these Jewish Christians, you're still trying to hang on to something that was temporal, something that was, had a purpose that God ordained, but that purpose is completely done with. God has, is no longer meeting you in the, tempor in the temporary or the earthly tabernacle. He's only meeting you through Jesus Christ who is in the heavenly tabernacle, which is far better in every arena. It's far better than what you had under Moses. And so these Christians, these Jewish Christians, are trying to hang on to the old while they have become partakers of the new. And he said, now we have access to God and we have the Holy Spirit abiding within us. Any questions? I think so. Uh, in the sense of, it says that when Jesus went into the, after he died on the cross, that he went and sprinkled his blood on the altar in heaven. Well, that is the, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about an altar to, to sacrifice sin. I'm talking about the mercy seat. Right. Okay. But there is, a, there is the, there seems to be the offering of, of the incense in heaven to where the incense is burned or offered up to God in heaven. But the mercy seat, definitely the mercy seat is there where the, he sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. And that's what the, that's what the, the priest did once a year. There wasn't an altar in the Holy of Holies. There wasn't an altar. There was, they, he didn't perform sacrifices in the Holy of Holies. He took the blood from the sacrifice from the altar outside and took it in with him and sprinkled it on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And that's the picture of what it would have been in the heavenly Holy of Holies. Other questions? These priests that were there at the time of Christ would not be thinking in terms of spiritual correctness. They would probably think that this was just an earthquake that caused this and we had to fix it back up for God, just like we always do things for God. Yeah. Oh, it is. We do. Because, because, yeah, that, that's what it's signifying. It's signifying that the old is, is over and that we do now have, because we're all priests, that we do now have access to God. That, that, yeah, I think that's all in there too. Time for one more? We're going to, we'll continue on this in two weeks because he goes on with some more information about the new covenant uh, in the rest of chapter 9. And in chapter 10, he continually deals with this subject about, about the sacrifice that Christ made because it is so important to these Jewish Christians that they, that they get it, that they understand that it's a once-for-all payment for sin. It's not like the old covenant where there was a continual, continual, continual sacrificing for their sins. That Jesus died once for all, and there's no need now to go back into that same ritualistic worship of God. We have access to God now, and we can worship directly we can worship, we can, we can pray to the Father 
directly through the name of Jesus because he is our high priest in heaven. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, I just pray as we continue to learn and to study all the, the implications of your dying on the cross has for us. And Lord, we praise you for that. And we pray that as we, as we do take communion, uh, that we would remember all that the implications and all that it means that you have died and taken away our sins. And now that we have access to you and access to heaven because of the righteousness that we have that's been granted to us through Jesus Christ. And we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.